Good morning, Jim Gaither. Good morning. Thank you, Richard. I want to thank everyone, first of all, participated in the service for the perfect synchronicity of all of your words and music for the topic for today. I wasn't sure uh, how that would work out, but I love it when a plan comes together. So thank you, uh, Richard, David, and, and the rest for um, coming up with this perfectly aligned uh, series of prayers, meditation, and music for this topic. I was enthusiastic about doing the topic of renunciation, as uh, uh, as Richard mentioned, and um, because I consider it to be in a very important uh, faculty power uh, in the 12 power system, and I think that it is often overlooked and underrated, so I'm going to bring it to its proper place in this system that we call 12 powers. Renunciation is our divine power to say no to things we don't want in our lives. It's our power to let go, release, relax, and very importantly, create space in our minds and our bodies and our affairs, create space for new ideas and experiences. It's uh, empty space, emptiness is as much a divine idea as any other idea. Empty space is necessary for a creation of any kind. You think about it, if there weren't space, one could not have forms within space or space within forms. Empty space is necessary for movement of any kind within the body or outside of it. There could not be any kind of universe without space within and without all things. We need an empty canvas for painting, an empty page for writing. We need spaces and pauses to make beautiful music. We need the space in windows and doors and rooms to make our houses useful. We need the empty space in a cup to hold our coffee. We don't often appreciate the value of nothingness. According to physics theory, space expands and quantum events can happen spontaneously in the vacuum of space. Some physicists believe that the Big Bang at the beginning of the universe was a quantum event in empty space. Nothingness is the infinite potential for somethingness. So in mysticism, God is sometimes described as no things because things have boundaries and borders, but God is without boundaries and borders. Consequently, I could talk forever about nothing, but I won't do that today. Every great spiritual teacher, every spiritual master had a highly developed power of renunciation. In Hinduism, someone who's dedicated themselves to attaining liberation, the ultimate spiritual goal, is called a renunciate. In Christianity, certain mystics, monastics, and saints were called ascetics, but that's just another word for renunciate. So before explaining or talking about this power of renunciation and how to develop and use it, I would like to mention a few renunciates, Western and Eastern, to illustrate what I mean by that term. So in the Western world and Western consciousness, the first important renunciate mentioned in the Bible was Elijah. He is a legendary figure, which means we don't really know much about him historically. He likely was a person who was dedicated to God and achieved a high level of spirituality and influence in Israel. He lived about 3,000 years ago, as near as we can figure. He, was, he, uh, he, he attained an elevated role in Judaism. For example, at Seder meals and in Jewish households, there is a tradition of having an empty chair and a glass of wine reserved for Elijah in case he returns. According to the Gospels, many believe that John the Baptist was Elijah returned. And it was, of course, that fundamental belief in Judaism that Elijah would return at the resurrection. Here is how Elijah was a renunciate. He did not work for a living. He did not have a house or possessions. He traveled around on his spiritual mission with no visible means of support. He relied entirely on God to guide and provide for him. He sat many days on a mountain waiting 
for God to come to him and was fed by ravens and angels. He stayed there until he heard in the silence, a still small voice. In short, he was not attached to worldly things and instead was attached to experiencing and following spirit. That non-attachment is what characterizes a renunciate. Of course, Elijah is best known to mo most people as a miracle worker. According to the biblical accounts, Elijah ended a drought by praying for rain. He multiplied oil and flour for a poor widow during a famine. He caused the waters of the Jordan to part. He raised a young boy from the dead. And he did not die in a usual way, but ascended directly into heaven, the chariot of fire. Of course, I don't know if any of this is true, but they're certainly good stories. They symbolically express the spiritual power of Elijah, the spiritual power of a renunciate. Likewise, Jesus is the exemplar of Christ consciousness. He was a renunciate. His, he and his disciples were renunciates in this traditional sense. When they traveled on their missions, they did not carry money, a wallet, or extra clothes. They did not concern themselves at all with accumulating possessions or homes or spiritual or political earthly power. They relied on love offerings to support them. They relied on God as their source. Now they did have a collective treasury and people contributed money to them, which they used to feed the poor. They ate whatever was given to them for their teachings. In short, they were not attached to worldly things. They cared only about knowing God and doing God's will. According to the Bible, Jesus performed works similar to those ascribed to Elijah, but more and greater works. And so this is the beginning of renunciation in this, in the Christian tradition. It begins with Jesus and the disciples. And later there were people who were called, who lived lives basically of hermits, Christian hermits. They're referred to in the tradition as the desert fathers, although there were also desert mothers as it happens. And they were mainly in Egypt. The first was Anthony the Great, who lived from about 270 to 356. There were other ascetics before him, but he was the first to go alone and live in the desert. He sold all his possessions, gave the proceeds to the poor, and went into the desert to lead a life of solitary prayer and spiritual development. According to the traditions, he ate but one meal a day, water, bread, and salt. In all this, he clearly is a renunciate. His severe lifestyle and dedication to prayer attracted a following of thousands of men and women who came out to learn from him and to give him offerings. So even though he tried to go apart and be alone, he's an example of what Emerson said, uh, if you build a better mousetrap, people will throng to your door. This is what happened. He went out in the desert to pray and people were attracted to him out here. And so he, he taught them and then eventually he helped them organize monastic communities in the deserts. It is reported that he healed many diseases. Well, this is the beginning of monasticism in Christianity. Christian monasticism is a life of renunciation. And it's the origin of most Christian mysticism. Through the centuries, men and women, monastics, have attained mystic consciousness and spiritual power. During the Dark Ages, it was the monks, the monastics, who preserved Western learning. And so there's a strong Western Christian tradition of renunciation, a renunciation that leads to, spiritual, leads to spiritual power. And there's the same thing in the East, in the Eastern world. In fact, in Hinduism, living as a renunciate is considered one of the four traditional stages of life. First, there's the unmarried student, then the householder, then there's retirement, and then there's renunciation. And so to become a renunciate in that tradition, usually people do that in late life, but young students also have, once they've completed their education, they have the option to skip the stages of householder and go directly into a life of spiritual uh, seeking, a life of the renunciate. They renounce their worldly and materialistic pursuits and dedicate themselves to spiritual liberation. 
the spiritual practices of Hindu renunciates are diverse because there are many different forms of spirituality within Hinduism. Many wonders and works are also attributed to various yogis of the Hindu tradition. We may also mention in the East, one other famous renunciate, Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha. Although he was born into a powerful and wealthy family, he left all that behind and went out to seek spiritual liberation. In fact, the Buddhist path as laid out originally by Siddhartha is a path of renunciation in a pure form. He left behind all that he had. And then in his teaching, he discerned in his prayer and meditation and search, he discerned that what attaches people to their karma, what attaches them to suffering are their cravings, are their worldly pursuits. And that these cravings and worldly pursuits are actually the cause of suffering. And so in his path, the idea was to overcome those cravings by following what he called the Eightfold Path. Is the intention of the Eightfold Path is to achieve nirvana. And in a nutshell, it is simply to think, speak, and act with the intention to do what is right rather than with an intention to get wealth or power or glory or any other selfish purpose or worldly pleasure. So these are just a few. We could also mention the Sufis and renunciation in that Sufi order in Islam. But the renunciates I've mentioned are really extreme examples. Renunciation isn't simply a matter of outer voluntary poverty. In fact, that is not fundamentally what it is. It is not necessary to go off and starve yourself in the woods or wander around without visible means of support in order to attain Christ consciousness. Renunciation is primarily and fundamentally a mental and emotional non-attachment to worldly materialistic beliefs and values. It is a mental release of the cravings, as Buddha put it, for wealth and power and pleasure. It is these cravings, it is these attachments that cause us to feel emotions when we are thwarted, like anger or jealousy or envy or hatred and so forth. Non-attachment opens the way for feelings of peace, joy, and love. Because peace, joy, and love are not fundamentally attained by achieving worldly goals, but rather by letting go and letting God. And that's the essence of renunciation. You might know about how Charles and Myrtle Fillmore made a covenant and they dedicated all that they were and all that they had to the spirit of truth. And in that covenant, they said they were doing this, recognizing that all that they needed would be provided. They understood that their wants, what they needed, would be provided, but they let go of that as their fundamental goal. They said, without any of these things being our primary purpose. The Fillmores, in their renunciation of all these sort of worldly kinds of pursuits that most people engage in, in the Western and Eastern worlds, in doing that, they recognized that they would be provided for, that their work would be provided for. They were house householders. They were married with children. They were not impoverished, but they also did not lead lavish lifestyles, which seems to be a sign of today of a successful evangelist. The more and bigger houses and stuff they have, the more spiritual they are. But that was not the way of the Fillmore's. They believed in moderation. And they believed in, most importantly, in good stewardship of the funds that they received from supporters. They were true renunciates. And Charles Fillmore specifically identified renunciation as a soul faculty or soul power that must be developed in order to attain the Christ consciousness. Christ consciousness is just another name for God consciousness or God awareness or self-realization if we think of the self as divine. So renunciation, he saw as an essential element 
of our souls and an element and a power that can be used for this purpose of attaining Christ consciousness. And also what he, his idea of regeneration. And I should say, this is really, I say Charles, but it's Charles and Myrtle who both held to these ideas. Regeneration is simply the idea of the outcome of transformation of consciousness, the outcome in the body of the transformation of consciousness is regeneration. So in the Fillmore system uh, of the 12 powers, uh, a power, every power is associated with one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. And it seems like appropriate thing for the power of letting go, the power of emptying that the disciple who is associated with renunciation is the one about whom the least is known, the most mysterious disciple. In fact, he has three different names, Thaddeus, Labius, and Jude. It's almost as if the authors of the gospels knew there was this other disciple, but they weren't really sure what his name was. Now, the truth is that unity people use their power of renunciation in many ways all the time. Every time you affirm, I let go and let God and open yourself in that way, or when you say I'm open and receptive to spirit, you are using your power of renunciation, the power of opening, the power of emptying our thoughts of negativity and opening to the creative power of the infinite. When we use denials, such as those found in Lessons in Truth and other unity writings, we are using the power of renunciation. When we practice forgiveness, we are using the power of renunciation. Myrtle's healing insight that I am a child of God and therefore do not inherit sickness was a denial. It was the use of the power of renunciation. One of the things that Charles talked about is denial. It's not simply or not only a matter of using formal denials. That one of my favorite ideas of his about what renunciation does is it's the ability to withdraw mental sustenance from low ideas. Whenever we withdraw our attention from the things that are worrying us or whenever we withdraw our attention from thoughts of imperfection or animosity or any other kinds of counterproductive, counterproductive ideas and images, we're using the power of renunciation. We are using the power of letting go and releasing. God is spirit. Therefore, ultimate reality is not material, but it is spiritual. And this truth may seem counterintuitive, but it is actually more compatible with what we know of physics than is the old concept of atoms, for example. In fact, many of the great philosophers and physicists, as well as mystics, have contended that the cosmos in its ultimate nature is mind stuff. But that's another topic for another day. The point is that when you are conscious, your mental attention and energy is always directed somewhere. So renunciation or denial is the power to withdraw your mental energy from counterproductive and materialist, materialistic ideas, but then you must also redirect your attention to spiritual truth. You can redirect your attention to the omnipresence of spirit. You can redirect your attention to feelings, of peace and love and joy. We think of forgiveness as an activity of love and it is but it is also an activity of release. It's the release of resentment. And so without the power of renunciation, we would not be able to forgive because forgiving is letting go. Now in this system, in this teaching of 12 powers, as you know, we understand that the intelligence is, that divine intelligence is present throughout the body, it's everywhere. And so each of the 12 powers is associated with centers in the body form, places through which we primarily feel them or which through which we might say they primarily operate. Renunciation is uh, primarily uh, operates in the abdominal region according to the system. The elimination process in the body is actually a manifestation of the spiritual creative idea of making space, the spiritual creative idea of letting go. And exercising this power then relaxes the body, reduces stress, and enhances health. 
you know, there are many physical ailments that are at least partly caused by excessive stress and can be relieved or helped by learning to release stress. So for example, if you were to Google the word, the, the phrase stress-related illnesses, you would find many examples and descriptions of this. For example, WebMD lists uh, the top 10 stress-related ailments, including heart disease, asthma, obesity, diabetes, headaches, depression, gastrointestinal problems, Alzheimer's, accelerated aging, and premature death. So none of those sound good, but if we lead a life of stress and continuing stress, any of these things can be created in our consciousness of our body. Reduction of stress through renunciation is helpful for preventing all these ailments and more. So the spiritual dimension, I'm going to say, first of all, renunciation is important for psychological well-being. That's why forgiveness has become such an important topic in psychological therapy. We must learn to withdraw our attention from disturbing ideas and obsessive ideas in order to be harmonious in consciousness. The spiritual dimension of renunciation is the most important. Spiritual masters of the Western and Eastern traditions released their attachments to materialistic values and consequently were able to redirect their attention again to development of spiritual consciousness and power. Again, it's not necessary to live in a desert or join a monastery, but it is necessary to learn, to let go, to release, to forgive, to withdraw our mental energies from limited thoughts of lack, limitation, and separation, all these ideas that permeate our worldly culture. Letting go of materialism and materialistic ideas may feel an uncomfortable at first. It is a, a fundamental nonconformity to society to adopt these attitudes, to withdraw our consciousness from the usual goals and values and materialistic beliefs of our society. But to be great is to be a nonconformist. Jesus and Buddha were nonconformists. All the great mystics and masters were nonconformists. Human progress requires making space for spirit in your consciousness, making space by letting go of those old limiting ideas of materialism. And so I want to close with a simple exercise to develop this power of renunciation, to make space for spirit in your consciousness. So I invite you to begin this exercise by being aware of whatever it is you're thinking and feeling right now and withdrawing your attention from that, directing your mental attention to these truths. God the good is all in all. God the good is all in all. Spirit is the only real presence and power in the universe. Only real presence and power in the universe is spirit. Therefore, no person is power. If you've thought of anyone in your life as having power over you, let that go. There's only one real presence and one real power, spirit, the absolute good. No person. No condition is power. No thing is power. Let go of all those ideas, persons, conditions, or things as having power in our lives, and we open ourselves now to the truth that there's only one real presence and real power in the universe, spirit, the absolute good. And now through the spirit power of renunciation, I let go of old limiting beliefs. Through the spirit power of renunciation, I release and let go of old limiting beliefs. I forgive, I release and let go of old resentments. I make space in my consciousness only for the spirit of truth and good. I invite you to take a moment to just Create that space, letting go and letting God, opening only to the truth of spirit right now in you, as you, and working for you.
in this moment and in this knowing, we affirm that this is truth. So we say, Amen.